2 Corinthians chapter 1. You guys know where we're going to be. Um, and we're going to be looking at a message this morning uh, entitled, Our Deliverer. Our Deliverer. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 11, just four verses. Um, but uh, next week we'll pick it, uh, next week or the week after we'll be picking it up. Um, next week's camp, so we won't be uh, potentially in 2 Corinthians, but then after that we'll be on our way. Now, from Genesis to Revelation, the Lord is depicted as a deliverer. That is someone who saves, someone who rescues, someone who preserves. Think about the very judgment upon Satan in the Garden of Eden, that in that judgment was a promise of a future deliverer that would crush the head of the serpent. He delivered Noah from the great flood, he delivered Abraham from a lonely life of empty idol worship. God delivered Joseph out of the pit and out of the prison and raised him up to save his own people. He delivered Moses and the children of Israel out of their plight in Egypt. He delivered Joshua from the wicked nations in Canaan. He delivered David out of many impossible situations and on and on it can go. Time and time again, when we look to the Old and New Testament, we find that God delivers. And he delivered his people. And I believe today he still delivers his people. And I think this is best portrayed. The best picture of God as deliverer is when you look to Jesus. We know him as savior, uh, but literally to deliver means to save, means to rescue. He is our New Testament equivalent of, of a deliverer. He has rescued us. He has preserved us and he will continue that work of salvation within the lives of those who look to him. Now, when you look to the scriptures, the Lord is not known as the preventer. He doesn't prevent things from happening in our life and us experiencing hard things, but he, always, he, he won't always keep us from trouble, but he will always see us through. He will always deliver us. And that phrase is something I'm going to be repeating throughout our time. This concept of God seeing us through. Now, last week, we talked about God as our comforter in the midst of suffering. Do you remember? This week, we will find that he is not only the God of all comfort, but he is the one who delivers. Not always in the way that we would want or when we would want it or even in the way that we would expect him to, but he always comes through. And as we talked about last week, this does not exempt us from difficulties and hardships, uh, but we can always trust the one who has our backs, the one that you and I call Lord or Savior. Uh, he is our deliverer. So let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. We'll be in 2 Corinthians 1. Uh, verses 8 through 11. And then we'll pray. 2 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 8, the Bible says this, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Let's pray. Fathers, we talk about today uh, difficulties, and your ability to deliver us. We ask that it would just all come, come into our mind as it should. So many wrong perspectives out there. So many false gospels and misconceptions about who you really are. But God, would you clarify in our minds who the God of the Bible really is? And God, would we take the truth that we learn here today and take it into our lives? Would it affect us? Would it affect how we live come Monday and Tuesday? And Lord, would we always trust you 
and not trust ourselves. We look to you for this, and in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Now, we're going to be looking at two major uh, points today, two main things. And the first one we're going to find in verses 8 and 9. If you're taking notes, the first thing we're going to spend some time on is the personal difficulties. And, and ultimately, these are Paul's difficulties that we're going to talk about and the things he went through. Now, we touched on this last week. We talked, remember, about suffering and hardships and tribulations. And as we pick it back up here in verse 8, we find that Paul gives a, an explanation into the nature of what he referred to in verse 4. So you should have your Bibles in front of you. Look back at verse 4. Remember, we saw that, that God will comfort us in all of our tribulations, well, in a similar way, he now references that again, uh, no longer talking about comfort, but talking about the deliverance of God. In verse four, he talked about his trouble or tribulations in a general sense. Now in verse eight and nine, he gets into the specifics, if you will. He gets into uh, some detail. It seems that Paul does this to connect with his readers. They that they might not only relate to him, but that they would pray for him. It seems that he hopes to share this testimony uh, as a way of encouragement. He, you see, Paul doesn't want them to think that he has some perfect, cushy life following Jesus. He says that he doesn't want them to be ignorant. Notice verse eight. He says, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Uh, the idea is he doesn't want them to have a lack of information. He doesn't want them thinking that following Jesus is always a breeze. Paul is very real and transparent here in verse eight and nine. He isn't trying to portray that following Jesus is always easy uh, and always um, uh, breezy, I suppose. Easy and breezy. Uh, it's not. That sometimes there's difficulties to the point of breaking, to the point of breaking, and Paul was here. You see, we don't know much. Uh, he, he doesn't give us too much insight into the, the nature of what, but the nature of how it affected him. Notice verse eight. He talks about this trouble that he experienced in Asia. Now, we don't know exactly which occasion he's referring to. Uh, maybe the, the Corinthians would have known uh, in a broad sense of uh, what happened, but he doesn't get... Uh, into too much detail into what, but more on how it affected him. Uh, now, there's so many times in the New Testament that, we've, that we read of Paul's trouble that it could be so many different occasions. Um, but apparently, Paul doesn't want his readers to, he doesn't feel the need to go into so much detail of what, but of how it affected him. And so I want you to note a couple things down. We find here in verse eight, three effects that came from this trial, this trouble, whatever it was. And I actually like that the scriptures leave it a little more broad because then I think you and I can begin to uh, insert to some degree ourselves within the text. Uh, now, again, we, we've talked about this. We know 2 Corinthians was not written to Calvary Chapel Chino Hills High School Ministry. It wasn't. It was written to the Corinthians. However, uh, it's preserved for you and I. And I think that we must take note of how Paul experienced what he would describe as this trouble. And this is going to set us up for seeing God ultimately as our deliverer. Now, note down number one, we find that he says that from this trouble in Asia, that he was, number one, burdened beyond measure. To be burdened is to be weighed down. Uh, to be under pressure. It's to be extremely distressed. The word picture is, is to carry something that is so heavy that you can't take it any further. Anyone, when, when moving from house to house, think you could carry a box and you really couldn't? And halfway through, you got to set it down? That's the idea of, of a burden. It's something too heavy for you to carry on your own. But not only does he say he was burdened, but burdened beyond measure. To be burdened beyond measure is the idea that there are not adequate words to describe the depth of this burden that was pressing in on Paul's life. 
He's seeking to use words saying that this was heavy and it was beyond heavy. It was something that he knew he couldn't do on his own. And that's where the second one comes in, not only burdened beyond measure, but burdened above strength. Whatever this was, and again, the Bible leaves out the specifics of what happened, and I think for a reason. It's above strength. This is the ability to do something, the power to perform. By Paul, there is a recognition that what he was dealing with in his life was beyond him, was beyond his ability to deal with it. He could see that they did not have what it took. And then third, he said that they despaired even of life. And this is the third and final one for a reason, because through this burden, it pressed in upon their life to the point where they felt like there was no out. The idea of despaired here is to fall apart. That he would say that at this moment, his life felt like it was falling apart. It's to lose one's mental composure and emotional stability. And he said, I despaired even of life, thinking there was no way out. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound super awesome. Uh, and, it, and this wouldn't necessarily be a verse that many people would use to share the gospel. Hey, follow Christ and you will then be burdened beyond measure, above strength, and might even despair even to life. You see, there's a lie out there that God won't give you more than you can handle. Have you ever heard that before? that God won't give you more than you can handle? You know that's not a verse in the Bible. God will absolutely give you more than you can handle on your own. He, he, will, and he will allow certain things in the life of the believer and we're gonna find to bring them to a place where they have to look for God, where there is no way out. You see, it's a lie that God won't give you more than you can handle. And maybe some of you today... You just, just reading these three, you would say, that's me. Man, I feel like right now I'm burdened beyond measure. Words don't quite, uh, there's no words to use to describe what I'm experiencing. I, I, don't ha I can't do anything about it above strength. And maybe for some, you even feel like your life is falling apart. And, and, and Paul would even go a sentence further. Look at verse nine. He said, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That sentence of death. Paul says that it, it, it felt as if they were as good as dead. The decision, the sentence, that's a verdict. That they looked at the situation and they concluded that in ourselves, that they expected to certainly die. Paul would be able to say after this, I looked death in the face. We don't know what he went through, but we knew it was intense. But why would God allow them to go through this? For what end? For what purpose? Why does God allow his own children? And, 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 and we looked at this a little bit last week in regards to the comfort he supplies. But I think there's more than just comfort. Does that God not care what we're going through? Did he not see Paul? I mean, think about Paul. He's one of the greatest men to ever live for Jesus. Uh, did so much for the kingdom of God. Did he not see or did God not care? Was he absent? Where was God? What was he doing? Well, the second half of verse nine explains what God was doing. Look at the second half of verse nine, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. You see, Paul is able to have this hindsight. He's able to look back at what he went through, which we're gonna find ultimately he was delivered from. And he's gonna say, the reason God allowed what he allowed was to bring me to this point of no longer trusting in myself. You see, you and I, we have a natural inclination. We have a sinful lean towards trusting ourselves. It's not what God created Adam and Eve like, it's what sin brought in. Sin in a human causes us to trust in us and no one else. And that's why the spirit of God has to come in and do, uh, do some heavy work, some heavy lifting. And so because of this, because we don't have to take a class on trusting ourselves, we just naturally do, sinfully speaking, then God sometimes has to bring us to the end of ourselves 
so that we no longer trust in ourselves. It makes sense. God sometimes has to allow the things of life that bring us to the, the, the places that could be described as this because he wants us to trust him. And now you and I, we know that we shouldn't trust in ourselves. We know that up here, we don't always begin to do that in our life. Um, we trust in our own abilities, our own understanding. But it's different when you get put in a situation where you feel like you can't do anything and you have no answers. And it's actually at that place where you are, I believe, closest to the kingdom of God. Because now God can bring you to a place of learning not to, that you can't do it. You don't have what it takes. And you see, that's the opposite message that the world preaches. The world preaches you have it in you. You gotta find yourself. And the Bible says you got, God wants to bring you to a place of where you no longer, in a sense, exist. Bring you to the end of yourself because that's where God can begin a great work in your heart. Jeremiah 17, verse five through seven says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and a salt land which is not inhabited. Essentially, the end of trusting yourself doesn't, isn't very satisfying. But verse seven, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. You see, the Lord knows the disaster that comes in the life of the believer who begins to lean on what they can do and lean on what they can come up with. And so why does God allow? Well, one of the purposes, not only to bring comfort that we looked at last week, but it's to bring us to this place that we look to him and him alone. And the way that, he, the reason that he has to do this is because you and I don't learn the easy way. You and I are stubborn. We're self-willed. The easy way would be to actually live the famous passage that we know of Proverbs 3. The easy way would be Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 becomes a reality in our life. And you guys know this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. You guys know it? It's a good one. Many of you have it memorized. But I have found that if we do trust in the Lord, it's not with all of our heart. We trust in the Lord with most of our heart. And we still lean a little bit on our own understanding. I mean, we like, you know, we love God and stuff. We trust him, but like, I still need to know like answers. And we acknowledge him in most of our ways, but not all of them. And so God allows us at times in our life to come to a place of the end of ourself that we might actually begin to trust him, actually begin to allow him to work in us fully. You know, it took a while for Abraham to get this lesson. You guys know Abraham in the Bible? Uh, Abraham had some uh, pretty gnarly laps, lapses of faith, lack of faith. Uh, he's known as the father of faith. He's listed in the hall of faith. But I mean, there are times where, I mean, not just once, like multiple times where he like lied that his wife was actually his sister when they went into Egypt because they were afraid that Pharaoh was gonna kill him because of how pretty his wife was. It's like very strange things uh, among, very, um, among many other things. Abraham does not have the cleanest history. Uh, however, over time, God brought him to a place of full trust. And it's awesome because by the time you get to Genesis 22, the biggest test of faith he would ever go through, uh, he passes with flying colors. You guys know what I'm referring to? Story of Abraham and Isaac, sacrifice your only son, the son of promise, the son who you had when you were a hundred years old. I want you to kill him, God says. And you see that Abraham does not resist the whole way. He does not lean on his own understanding. He trusts in God with all of his heart. And to the point where he had the knife, not just with him, but raised. And of course, hopefully you know the story. He didn't kill his son. Uh, the angel stopped him. How was he able to do that? How, how did he come to that place of faith? Well, for Abraham, Hebrews eleven nineteen 19 
uh, the author of Hebrews gives us a little insight into what was in Abraham's mind. When, when he's got that knife raised and he's about to plunge it into his son of promise, what was he thinking? Well, he was concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, for which he also received him in a figurative sense. You see, he didn't understand how and he didn't understand why, but he trusted God and the promises of God where he said, well, even if I do kill him, then God's gonna have to raise him up from the dead because God keeps his promises. Now that's faith, that's trust. But many times over, God had a work in Abraham's life bringing him to the end of himself. And so God will also allow us to face trouble in our own lives, tribulations, that we might learn not to trust in ourselves, but in God who literally raises the dead. So maybe God's speaking to some of you today. Maybe you would, you would identify with those three things. And you say, man, I feel like I have the sentence of death in my life. I feel like there is no way out. Listen, it's time to look up and, and look to the deliverer. And maybe today you're like, no, I, that's, that's not me. Well, maybe you know someone. Maybe you've looked at their life and you said, man, why would God allow them to go through this? God's at work. He's not absent. And uh, that's awesome. Secondly, the powerful deliverance. So we looked at the, the, the personal troubles and uh, difficulties. Uh, but the second thing and, that we're going to look at today is in verses 10 through 11. And this is where now Paul's on the, on the backside of it, right? He's through the trial and he's able to look at it with hindsight. He's able to see, see back at it and, and see God's goodness. In verse 10, he talks about his deliverance. And he says, he's delivered us from so great a death. He does deliver us and in whom we trust. So now Paul learned that he will still deliver us. Now, I've made mention now a couple times that God will always see us through. And I do believe that, that if you're a believer, God will always come through. He will always deliver. Now, as I was studying this, I had to then ask myself the question of, well, what about people in the Bible like Stephen? Did, did God come through for Stephen? I mean, he got stoned to death. You know who I'm talking about, Stephen in the Bible, the first martyr? This, this man was on fire for Jesus, rocked, rocked that, that, that city for Jesus. And yet his end is the Pharisees throwing stones at him to the point of death. And that, that's his end? Or what about those in North Korea who get discovered as being Christians because of, of a little page of the Bible was found in their possession and they get put to death? Does God then always deliver? What about when I prayed, and this is figurative, uh, when I prayed for my grandma, who is a believer, and I prayed that God would give us more time, but he took her home. She passed away. So how do, how do you tell me that God always delivers? Because you might have circumstances in your life where you feel like God didn't come through. Well, it all depends on your perspective on what deliverance really entails. Sometimes we think of, God's deliverance as doing what we want, when we want it, and in the way that we want it. And so if it doesn't fall in line, well, then God didn't come through. He's untrustworthy. But you see, he is not our preventer. I told you this. He is our deliverer, which means he will allow us to go through things for our own good and benefit. And sometimes, listen, we're going we're to find for Paul, he makes it out. That those three things that he experienced, he's now on the, on the backside of them. He no longer is experiencing those. And so he is able to say, God delivered us from so great a death. And so he will sometimes absolutely deliver. And we pray for that. And we're commanded to pray for that. And so that's why if there's situations, if there's circumstances of trouble and tribulation, whether it's persecution or just difficulties of life, we can absolutely pray for God's deliverance. But you see, whether he delivers here in the time frame that we think of, or he will deliver us out of it by taking us to himself. You see, when Stephen was stoned and killed, God delivered his soul. Do you remember the picture 
Stephen looks up and as he's being stoned, he sees Jesus not sitting on the throne, but standing, receiving him into his kingdom. And it was quite the experience. God was delivering his soul. And even to this day, Stephen's soul is still in heaven. He is delivered from this this sinful world, delivered from an eternity of hell. You see, if you and I went to heaven and we said, Stephen, did God deliver you? He would say, look around. Look, yes. Yeah, my body's there. I'll one day get it back at the rapture. But he delivered me and I'm here and I'm alive and I'm well even 2,000 years later. You see, God will always deliver, not always in the way and the time and in the way we expect, but I believe at the end of what we call time, we, God will stand as a triumphant deliverer and we'll say, God was faithful. He's trustworthy. Now, in our text right here, I want you to note down that in verse 10, we find the word delivered three times in some form whether in past tense, present tense, or future tense. Three times in one verse, he mentions this idea of deliverance, which means to rescue, right? To save, uh, to preserve. Now, I believe that verse 10 shows us, gives us an insight into the expansive nature of God's deliverance. It's not just what he has saved us from, It's actually what he's doing now. And because of his faithfulness in the past and current, we can trust him. Without knowing the future, without knowing what's going to come, we can trust that he is going to see us through. And that's what Paul can say here. That's where he's saying, man, God got us out of it. And I know God is still working to this day. The reason I have breath in my lungs and I'm even who I am is because of what God's doing. It's a perspective. And because of that, he says, I can trust that he will still deliver us. And this, this is displaced for us the nature of God, that he is a deliverer. Now, you're probably not going to have time to write down uh, the whole verse. There's just verse 10 broken up in three ways. And so even in your own Bibles, you can write past, little, little letters, present, and future. Uh, and we're going to come back to this at the end of our study and look at it Uh, in regards to our own salvation, how God has saved us, how he is saving us, and how he promises us to still save us in the future. But just note down past, present, and future. Now, I want to go for a moment to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was the last letter written by Paul. And um, it's a letter that when he wrote it, he was both in prison and he knew his end was coming. He knew that the physical deliverances that he did experience in the past were coming to an expiration and God was gonna begin delivering him in a new way. Uh, He was on what you could call death row. Uh, He was up for execution by the Roman emperor at the time. Uh, And that execution was gonna come, uh, as history tells us, by decapitation. Uh, his head would be removed from his body. And so with that in mind, he writes 2 Timothy. And what's amazing is that you don't see him depressed and down. You don't see him saying, man, I follow Jesus and look where this got me. No, you see him talking about the deliverances that he's experienced and the future deliverance that he will experience. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, it's actually 10 through 12. Um, It says this, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. He went through it. And he says, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, to some extent, will suffer persecution. I love this, that at the end of his life, Paul is able to say so confidently, knowing he is about to die, he's able to say, God has delivered me out of all of them. He's able to see see God's fingerprints, in a sense, all over his life. And um, 
after years of suffering, trials, I mean, someone could look at Paul's life and say, it doesn't seem like you had it very easy. Uh, we're going to get to a chapter eventually of chapter 11 in 2 Corinthians. And in that chapter, you can find a list where it lists all the things he went through. Shipwreck, uh, 39 uh, stripes upon his back uh, from a Jewish council, imprisonments, uh, left for hunger, left for dead. Uh, so many things. And you're like, and he gets to the point, he says, the Lord delivered me out of all of them. Yeah. He didn't prevent Paul from going through it, but he saw him through every time. Now, a skeptic might say to Paul there on death row, the Roman emperor is going to cut off your head from your body. And this is where your faith got you. This is how God is a deliverer. And I think Paul would respond something along the lines of to live as Christ and to die as gain. You see, that was his perspective. That either way, it ended good. And this is to be our perspective as believers, that whatever we're going through now, we know that it ends good. And that can give us hope in the meantime. Then at the end of his letter, chapter four, which is the last chapter, verses 17 and 18, check this out. He says, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Apparently that happened to him. Verse 18, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever, amen. You see, Paul wasn't always about getting out of his present circumstance. He was about the glory of God. And he knew that even if his head would be removed from his body, that he would be delivered by God. And uh, I love that perspective. You see, death is actually the greatest tool of deliverance for the believer. Because think about it. Let's say you're going through something hard, difficult, maybe even, even in the category of persecution. And let's say God delivers you, meaning like you get out of it and, uh, and you keep going and maybe God was faithful in some way. Okay, well then, there's gonna be something else. But you see, the greatest deliverance is death because when the believer dies, that is not his end. Uh, that's merely a new beginning. That's graduation to heaven. And so the greatest deliverance of God is when he takes us home, either when we die here or when he comes back for us. I love, uh, I love Daniel's friend's perspective on this. You guys remember Daniel 3? Daniel 3 is the uh, chapter in the book of Daniel when Daniel is ap actually absent and his three friends, who we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, come up front stage. And uh, you guys know the story, right? There's the image, Nebuchadnezzar, crazy, crazy guy, tells him to bow down. They refuse. He says, well, I got a really hot furnace, so I'm gonna throw you in. And uh, then this is the response. And I love, notice, the confidence, and yet the submission to what God wants to do. You see both. He's confident that God is deliverer, uh, but he also doesn't claim to know how it's all going to end. Daniel 3, verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this manner. If this is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to, what does it say? Deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. This is the type of attitude that even as New Testament believers, you and I are to have. That God will come through. He's able to, and we believe that he will. We pray for it. Uh, but if not, either way, we win. Either way, it's good. Even the worst things that happen here are not right worthy to be compared with the glory that will follow. It's one thing to know this perspective. It's another thing to live it. And you and I are to live it. You and I are to live it no matter what we go through, no matter what we experience. You know, I mentioned David in our introduction and the story that comes to mind with David uh, was of course, David and Goliath. Uh, and we saw how God obviously delivered him. And there's some, uh, during that, that buildup, uh, he talks to King Saul, right? He's first got to con convince King Saul to put him in the game, right? To put him on the battlefield. 
in the first place. And one of the ways that he does that is he shares a story how he killed personally as a young, young boy uh, a lion and a bear. It's rather insane, uh, but God delivered him. And so based upon the past, he had this confidence that it don't matter who is there, uh, God's going to deliver. And so he says, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And here we have a key to, for us to know what the Lord has done for us in the past. And I think primarily even what he did for us on the cross, that if he died for us on the cross and there's nothing, there's to no extent that he won't go for us. His love and care for us is now unquestionable because of the extent of what he did for us. And so when we look to the past deliverance of God, we recognize what he's doing for us in the present. That is what, that is what will enable us to trust him with the future of what we don't know. But do we look to him? Do we cry out to him? When we feel burdened beyond measure, above strength, and maybe even despaired even to life. Well, the Bible describes the Lord as a strong tower that you and I are to run to, as a refuge that we're to hide in, as a rock that we're to stand on. So many terms describing what God wants to be for those who love him. Psalm 34, verse 17 through 19 says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, many, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now listen, the only, only one, the only type of attitude that God can't help is the attitude that I don't need help. That's why in the very middle here, it says the Lord is near, present. To who? To those who are broken. To those who come to that point of recognizing, because listen, sometimes God allows people to become broken, pressed down, above strength, despairing even of life, and yet they still don't turn to him. They, they still think, they, they still look to themselves. And unfortunately, that, that's just how they continue. But God the way, the, way, the way to open the door of God coming through, of delivering, is looking to him, is recognizing I don't have what it takes. The Bible says that God will not turn away. He will not despise those of a broken and contrite spirit, that those who call in the name of the Lord shall not be put to shame. It's awesome. So do we look to him? Well, notice verse 11, Paul ends this section by thanking the Corinthians for their prayer for them regarding this deliverance. Verse 11 says, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. It's here that Paul indicates that he believes that the Corinthians prayers actually had an effect regarding the deliverance that he experienced. This is wild. Now listen, ultimately God does what he wants, but he invites us to pray according to his will, and we actually then get a part to play. Notice verse 11 in your Bibles. He says, you also helping together. That's the word to collaborate, to join in for help. This is one of the reasons why we as leaders want to pray for you guys. We want to, in a sense, collaborate with what God's doing in your life. And we want to come alongside and join. We want to help. And apparently, according to the scriptures, prayer does that. Prayer does that. And that's why we even want you praying for each other. Because the scriptures say, and I've absolutely experienced, that there is power to prayer. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand all the, the ins and outs of the spiritual world. Um, but I just know that God says, you pray and I'm hearing, and I'm moving because of that. And for the, Paul, he's able to actually look back and say, hey man, I know it was your prayers that had some effect. It wasn't your power, it was God's power and was affected by your prayers. And how cool is that? You know, I love that Paul was never ashamed and embarrassed to ask for prayer. 
uh, in more than half of his letters of the New Testament, he actually puts a personal request for prayer in. Um, as Paul helped them by instruction, uh, they were able to help him by prayer. Philippians 1, verse 19 through 21 says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer. There's another instance earlier in his life. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body. Notice, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And here's the difference maker. Is that even when it appears that God does not deliver someone, he actually did it in the best way possible. There was actually, that, that was option A. And so you see, for the Christian, I love this perspective. He says, he says, whether by life or death, like Christ is going to be magnified. We're going to pray for God to do it uh, in the way that we think is a, it, it would, would be good, which is keeping Paul here. But within the will of God, we submit ourselves to that. And whether by life or death, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, as we begin to close this out, I told you that I wanted to look back at verse 10 as a model for our own salvation. Do you remember that? Remember I showed you the past, present, future nature, nature of uh, God's deliverance? Well, listen, <clears throat> this, this deliverance that Paul experienced uh, was something personal to him, but what I think it portrays for us, what I think we can take from it uh, shows us the full nature of what Jesus really did on the cross. Because it doesn't just affect the past, but it affects the present and the future. Colossians 1.13, just a couple to note down. Uh, he has delivered, that's that same word. He has delivered us, that's believers, from the power of darkness and conveyed, transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love that he has delivered us, that's salvation. But then there's also a future salvation we're waiting for. First Thessalonians 1.10 says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who what? What does it say? Delivers us from the wrath to come. So this is something that's not yet happened. And this is what we believe is gonna happen either by our, our death, then we're saved from the wrath to come, or by the rapture, which is Jesus taking his church before he pours out his wrath upon a wicked world. But verse 10 serves for us as a model. So look back at verse 10 in your Bibles, and then you can begin to look to the screen. Now, what I think we have here is a, is a good picture of what it means that Jesus has saved us. I think far too often our perspective is far too small. But what Jesus did on the cross was first and foremost, he justified us. That's, that's what the Bible calls justification. And it's really interesting. You know, you, you read through the New Testament and there's verses that say you were saved. Then there's verses that say you are being saved. And then there's verses that say you will be saved. And you might ask, well, which is it? And the answer is all three. Because the work of Christ on the cross is big. And the first implication has to do with the past tense, that you were saved from so great a death. This has to do with your positional salvation that never changes. This could be the phrase, I am in Christ, okay? So when someone says, I'm saved, this is what they're talking about. But in a very real sense, you and I right now as believers, we are in this process of being saved, and that's what the Bible calls sanctification. That's a process of you becoming less like you and more like Jesus. And this has to do with the progressive nature, that meaning uh, from the day you get saved uh, to the day that you die, it's not that you're more saved, but you sure look like it. You look more like Jesus, that the reality inwardly starts to show itself outwardly. This is sanctification. This is, I am becoming like Christ. Does that make sense? And then thirdly, and this is yet to come, is glorification. This is what we're looking forward to. This is, this is what we have 
to wait, whether by death or by rapture, this is something that's permanent. This is the idea. When we say, I want to be with Christ, we're talking about glorification. This is the fact that we will be saved from this world. We will be saved from eternal condemnation, from hell, and we will be with Jesus. Now listen, these three phrases, very important that you know the distinction, but don't think of them like a Chipotle bowl, all right? Where you go and you get to pick which ones you want. Uh, No, if you have one, you got all three. There's no one who's justified that God isn't seeking to sanctify. There's no one who is sanctified and justified that will not be glorified. This is a guarantee. This is a guarantee. And it's awesome. And it's something we should know. We should know the full expanse, uh, expansive nature of God's salvation for us because it, it gives us assurance and it gives us encouragement in the moment and it gives us a future hope. And listen, if you've experienced God's work in your life, then the Bible says, he who started a good work in you will be faithful. He will be faithful to complete it, to see you through. Very last verse is 1 Corinthians 1.30 that says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, our verse of the week, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And those last three, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, they display that threefold nature, the three phases of salvation. He's given us his righteousness. He gives it. He, he gives us, we are now, this, there's this sanctification. That's what he does in us. And redemption or glorification, he will seek to finish what he started. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you are both loving and powerful. You don't just care, but you act, and you did act. And Lord, I think of that verse in Romans 8 that says if if you've given us your son, you've not spared even your son from us on that cross, then Lord, will you not freely give us all things? And you will, and you do. We're so grateful that you're, you are a good father who knows how to take care of us. Uh, and we're just grateful, Lord, that even in the moments of life where it's hard to breathe, we feel burdened above strength, we despair even of life, that you're present and that you're near to those who are broken, have a contrite heart, and you just, you want us to come to the end. Think of the prodigal son who ended by eating pig slop. The Bible says there that he came to himself. Really, Lord, we know he came to the end of himself. And that's what enabled him to start thinking clearly, to go back to the Father. And pray for any students here, Lord. And they, they would say today, I'm at the end. Lord, would they look up? Would they see the Savior? Would they see the Deliverer? And would you move in their life? God, we are so grateful for Jesus. And that's why we sing about the blood, the blood applied. We thank you, Lord, for that sacrifice for us, that we might be saved, that you might keep saving us, that one day we know you will save us. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.